Jim was kind enough to come over. He's with the Baltimore Fizz, though, as you may have noticed on the flyer. He's been, uh, he has a very deep and rich background as an AMP IA. For over 42 years, he's been an AMP. He's been an IA for over 30 years. Extensive work uh, with helicopters, uh, but all sorts of, uh, with corporate, with uh, state government. Of course, now he's with the FAA. We're real lucky to have him. And we really appreciate him coming and talking about uh, something he's very good at talking about, along with many other things. So I think you'll enjoy it, yeah, uh, If you have any questions about uh, I don't know, maintenance or what have you, we've got, we've got a very rich background with a number of AMPs. And, and we're going to continue that with Jim tonight. Please help me welcome Jim. Jim Logan. So today um, we're going to talk about aircraft wiring, trickle systems. You don't see a whole lot of activity with them, but they do a lot of work for us. And um, it is, uh, I, I presume, um, in the, um, the, the, the amateur or the, the, um, the, the you know, the, the kit build aircraft, um, there's more and more um, moving towards uh, glass cockpits and so forth. If the systems are getting more sophisticated, all that much more um, criticality of, of good, effective, solid wiring practices. So, um, so anyway. Would you stand up in front? So, yeah, I tell people, I'm, I'm not your standard FAA guy. I'm a little bit too charismatic and it makes people uncomfortable sometimes. We're just here to help you. <laughs> We're not happy to. We're not happy. Um, no, in all actuality, how many people know about the FAST team and some of the, the stuff that, whoa, okay. Okay, the FAST team, we are not allowed to do certifications for airmen or aircraft. We're not allowed to do accident investigations. We can be, go to it and gather information, but we can't do the investigation. We also are not allowed to do violations. So if you have a question, you can bring it to your fast team person and your story dies with us. Now, if it's something really big, I might say, um, you probably need to go to a regular inspector on this, um, in a, whether ASAP it or voluntary disclosure or something like that, because it's always better to come clean on the front side than it is after the fact. Hence the reason I've, set, I've made it um, as long as I have, I guess. Or, or I'm too slow, but I tried under the radar. Um, so anyway, so the Baltimore FISA, you have an airworthiness fast team person, me, and you have an operations fast team person, Jerry Pratt. Jerry Pratt's probably got like 40 billion hours in his logbook. I don't know, he's done 15 years with the flight instruction, flew corporate um, with challengers and stuff like that. He lives over in Easton, Maryland. He's getting ready to retire in um, December. I'm hoping they replace him because most FISDOs only have one or the other. Um, they just created my position back in September. Um, 15 years of the agency, I was five years at Dulles as an uh, airworthiness inspector covering Dulles Airport, uh, Reagan, Andrews Air Force Base, 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 Manassas, Leesburg, all the way down to Bridgewater, all kinds of stuff like that. Went to BWI six years, assistant principal in Piedmont. I helped bring them from the Dash 8s to the uh, Embraers. Um, I oversaw the conversion of the maintenance program, big stuff. And did the proving runs where they, they've got to fly in 40 hours to show their ability to safely operate the aircraft. Um, and then I took an assistant manager job in Harrisburg. And am I like, glad to be out of that. Um, this, this, this fast team thing is it's a nice, I don't want to say icing on the cake, but I think I can do this. Um, so, wiring. The battery, it, it's important. You, you can have short term effects and you can have long term effects from um, electrical system failures. And um, so we're going to talk about some of these things. We're going to um, give you uh, some insight on the components and the, um, um, the interconnect on the systems. And um, this is primarily, I do this presentation a lot of times with maintenance people, as well as the AP school in, in Hagerstown and elsewhere. And um, I think it's particularly good for you as, in your, as builders things that you can look at and be aware of as the aircraft's going together, as well as when you're performing your own condition inspection. And uh, so um, the electrical system, you can see on the left, you've got batteries, generators, alternators, the different wiring, the wire conductors, shielding, and um, switches and current limiting devices are your circuit breakers and things of that nature. Aircraft circuit breakers are what they call trip free. If you've got a hard short, you can push that breaker all day long and the system won't reset as long as that's short there. If you have a circuit breaker and you have a hard short and you're able to reset it, you've got a bad circuit breaker and they do exist. There was an AD that came out a number of years ago that the circuit breakers were falsely tripping and you were unable to trip reset them. Um, I think they were clicks on, if I remember. Um, 
hopefully they're all out of the system at this point. Uh, your circuit breakers, it should have a little thing in the middle of it that says how many amps it is. Okay, if that's missing, that's caused to replace it. Um, the other thing on the back of an aircraft circuit breaker that many people overlook, there's a plus and a minus, an inlet and an outlet. If it's backwards, it's not gonna function properly. So, um, so just little things called situational awareness, you know, as it's going in. Um, I always like before I commit to put it, replacing one, because they're never easy to replace. It's always doing a half pretzel up underneath the panel somewhere. Um, I pull it and reset it just to make sure, because if you have an emergency in the cockpit and you've got to disable that system, it may entail pulling the breaker. So um, one thing we used to do um, on test flights, if the circuit breaker pops, you can reset it once. After that, we ain't pushing it again. Um, so, um, okay, so um, almost the, uh, the smaller aircraft that we see around here, the system's gonna have an alternator, generator, the battery, and then of course a, um, a battery master switch, turns everything off and on. And, um, you know, bus bar fuses. Um, current limiters are typically big fuses on larger aircraft are located in places that you cannot get to them in flight. That's intentional. Um, typically they're underneath the floor and it, it will require a maintenance person to replace it. I mean, I've seen 50 amps, I've seen 150 amp current limiters. Um, and uh, you'll lose some of the more complex aircraft. You have a right bus, left bus, and even a center bus. And um, so, okay, types of batteries. This is um, something that um, I think I talked to Tom maybe recently. Um, we were talking about um, the batteries. There's, there's, there's now these lithium batteries. And um, I got churched up today when I called one of the lithium battery manufacturers. I said, tell me about these lithium ion batteries. We don't have lithium ion batteries. Those are a fire hazard. They're lithium phosphate or some other lithium, but they're not lithium ion. So that was a um, kind of a uh, pearl of wisdom to me. And um, let's see if this see here. Oh, no, it's not gonna do it. So um, so let's back up that bad boy. So we have the, um, the lithium ions, the, um, Boy, I wish I could drag that down there. Um, okay, so that's I just needed a memory jog. Maintenance people, we always use the maintenance manual. That's why, you know, um, just like a pilot, use your checklist. No matter how many times a day you start the aircraft, use your checklist. Um, so we have the lead, lead acid batteries, which have the, the you know, the, um, the typical acid in there. Um, they're standard and sealed. Um, the, the standard ones have the caps, and then there's a a, a valve in there so it, uh, it doesn't uh, leak should it get uh, knocked over um, inverted make darn sure that the, the vent hose is properly venting overboard because if it isn't that makes corrosion in an engine compartment or a battery compartment real quick um, I can show you some uh, some pictures that I have on my phone that somebody gave me here recently and um, and then you have the sealed which is also referred to sometimes as a recumbent gas battery it may look like there's some caps on there no, the idea is not to open it. And the third type in, in that standard is what they call a, um, a gel battery, gel cell. Um, and that uses kind of like a jelly kind of acid in there. And um, it helps prevent spillage. You definitely don't service those for sure. Um, and then, of course, the, the nickel cadmium, NICAD, um, like in a gray picture there, they're really heavy. I mean, really heavy. And um, they have to be um, serviced at least on an annual basis, completely disassembled. Each one of the cells inside come out, they get cleaned. And the way to only, you don't just charge them. The only way you can properly charge a NICAD battery, if you have one, is you have to completely, completely deplete it, clip it off and short it out, and then start from scratch. And only it, then, at the end of that process, can you add water if it's necessary. Um, when, when I worked for, uh, I spent 18 years as um, the state police in Maryland and we had the, the NICADs. We had one guy, that was his whole job, was to do batteries. Um, those aircraft had four batteries on, on board um, for different systems. And um, I can't tell you about the new ones because I left just before they came. Um, and then now the latest and greatest thing is lithium. Smaller, lighter. Um, after I spoke to that guy today, he's gonna, he's gonna send me some more information. But the bottom line is before you buy any battery, read the manual, learn about it. Make sure it's gonna have enough power for you before you put it in. Um, I've seen some situations where, um, now these use the quick connects, but I've actually seen cases where the quick connects on the aircraft were wired backwards. And I had a, I had a number of years ago, I had an argument with a guy, we were on a contract with an aircraft, he goes, it's not starting because the batteries. I said, look, you're the pilot, I'm the mechanic. 
If you insist on doing it, you do it, but I just let you know I quit. I'll find a way home. So um, needless to say, he didn't change the battery. Uh, there, was a, there was indeed a problem. Um, so like I say, the lithium, before you just go changing it to a lithium, make sure you know what you're buying and uh, seek some assistance. Uh, especially if it's a certificated airplane like a Cessna or a Beach or something like that. The amateur built or experimental class. Please forgive me, I gotta get away from the amateur. I don't like it. Um, so for the experimental class, you have a lot more latitude and um, just uh, be aware. Um, starters, generators, alternators. Um, in the picture, that's a typical alternator like you'll see. Um, on some of the airplanes like um, Mark flies for the jets, you'll see something that looks more like one of the two on the left-hand side. That, um, the direct drive. Um, if you ha get involved with an aircraft, one of those, there are, in most cases, lubrication requirements for those splines. And um, so, again, that's, what, that's a maintenance person job. Um, yeah, many times, you can see there, caref does this have a pointer on it? Yes. Yeah, the Ooh, is that the red? Yeah. Oh, look at that. See right here? There's a little safety wire right there. Make sure that's on there. Um, they get away. And um, is it, if, as it breaks loose, it's not uncommon for, the, n number one, it'll lose tension, but it'll break here too. Now you've got flippy floppy parts in the engine compartment. Um, okay, the wires. Um, you, can, you can see here, um, they, they use the term harness, which is the groupings of wires. Um, modern wires, um, or I should say wires in general will back up, uh, are sized not only by the amount of current, but the length. You know, the, it's just like a garden hose. The, the, if you make it too long, it can't push that current through there like it needed. Um, one of the, I'm sure you're all using the advisory circular 4313. And of course, your build, there's some nice charts in there how to determine what size wire you need. Um, there's a little one. So this is the shielding, okay? When properly installed, that looks like a couple of coaxes and whatnot. They do not necessarily get co connected to the ground or bonded to the airframe on both ends, only one end. Okay, you can set up some false paths with it being bonded on both ends. And there's, um, so that, that shielding is to be connected on one end and it reduces um, any stray, stray voltage and currents. How do you know you have something like that going on? Static in the radio. And, um, and, there's, um, and now you get with a more complex aircraft with the glass cockpits, it could result in some failure high dollar avionics. Um, when the guys work on those, those expensive avionics on the bench, they're bonded. They put a wrist thing on that connects from them to the table, to the pad that whatever the radio is sitting on because um, you think that stuff's expensive when you buy it on sporties? It, it, it goes way up. So, um, so anyway, you can see the bundling and what there. Um, let's see what they say here. Um, so, um, capped on wire. Capped on wire, um, those that were in the military or helicopters a number of years ago, um, was popular. It's actually a wrapped insulation. It's fortunately or unfortunately, it's been taken out of service. Um, the Swiss air crash, air, airlines crash up in, um, off the coast of Canada was pretty much the, um, where the galley caught fire from the, the capped on wire um, was pretty much the end of it. But it was used highly by helicopter manufacturers in, in the military. Boeing used it, McDonnell Douglas used it for a while. And um, you can see the insulation is kind of wrapped. It's really thin. And what makes it even more challenging is it has this orange thing here. You can't tell if it's exposed wire or it's that orange covering. Mm -hmm. And um, I work with, a, we, do we have any uh, engineers here that work for the wiring manufacturers? Mm -hmm. Well, we, 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 we added an R to the work, the capped on. Um, <laughs> You figured it out. Uh, we just did not like it because most of the wiring aircraft, you can bend it pretty severely. That stuff, not so much. Your bend radiuses were, were easily double. Um, the new wires insulation is uh, Tefzel, which is really a remarkable stuff. Oops, and there you go. There's our reference to Tefzel. Um, shielding, we, we spoke briefly about shielding. Uh, and you can see in, inside that aircraft there, there's a whole bunch of, bunch of wiring. And... Um, so, and like I say, the shielding is putting that um, uh, wire uh, braiding over it. And there's certain practices that to be used in 43 on how to do that. Uh, wire installation and routing. Um, your 4313, you, we call it just 43 or 4313. There's chapter 11 speaks all to wiring and uh, really good stuff. And um, so, uh, how many people use tie wraps 
to serve this function. Okay, well, and we all do because it's quick and easy, right? Well, there's, it can be a problem. You could say the masters use lacing cord. It's a wax cord, wax thread. It's beautiful when you see it. It, it takes extra time to do it, but it will not chafe through the insulation. We're gonna show a picture here where it, should, where it has chafed through. The other thing that's a negative on tie wraps, how many people cut them with their side cutters? Diagonal cutters, or do you have a tie wrap gun? Flush cutters. There you go, exactly, or a tie wrap tool, because it leaves a little teeny tiny end there sticking out, and I'll get the back of our hands, always find with that little end sticking out, or it could be chafing into something you don't want it to chafe into. So um, they're great, but like, like so many other things, they can, they can have limitations when not used properly. Um, I saw Tom shaking his head and go, yeah, yeah. Um, these um, properly supported, um, you know, with the uh, ADEL clamps, we're gonna show some pictures of how not to install some ADELs. Okay, um, and of course, now I, I like, I, I duplicated this picture um, for a reason. 43 talks about wire marking. How many people when they build an aircraft don't have any marking on it, where the wire, where the wire, how the, when I say wire marking labeled, it goes from, I don't know, it goes from the panel clean all the way back to the strobe light or position light. Well, you know, this is one end and this is the other end, but if something happens to it midstream, how do you know which wire is which? Per the advisory circular, they're to be marked every 15 inches. Now, you can choose to do that or not, but the, I'm going to grab my thing here because I have something to pass. Um, doing that will, one, it'll make your life a whole lot easier as things wear out, and two, it could increase the value of the airplane when it comes time to get rid of it because people will see that difference in workmanship. So you can mark it. Um, the tough cell wiring, you can, um, the factories have a way to, um, to mark it through, the, through a heat gun kind of thing. It rolls through and it marks it every 15 inches or a foot. Um, another way um, is you can buy a machine to do it locally at your house or your shop. Um, this is a handy dandy way that I got to doing it was heat shrink. You can buy heat shrink in lots of different colors. And if you write it with a, with a pen, a ballpoint pen, and then heat shrink it on, your wording shrinks with it and it's there for a long, long time. So you don't have to write it real small after you shrink it on the wire. Write it on here before you shrink it on the wire. And, um, and you guys can pass that around. I know you know what heat shrink all looks like. Um, and of course, here's, here's another piece. Um, that's just a conventional black piece. And um, so, um, so in accordance with the, the advisory circular 4313, chapter 11, I said is wiring, uh, section 16 is your wire marking. Um, when, as you're building it, you can think about how do I want to label these things? Um, just be wire one, two, three, and then as your build sheet, you reference say, okay, wire one's gonna be this. Or use a code, light, you know, if it's simple. If it's multiple, you could have light one, light two, um, and so forth. Um, and so yeah, um, on those wiring codes, um, we talked about how, how it's marked, whether the heat shrink or the embossed wire. Way back when you used to see aircraft wiring with colors, um, but the colors don't work quite as well with the tough cell wires. So any questions there on that so far? Okay, so when you install wires and, um, and, <clears throat> and whatnot, be mindful where it's going. It's gonna get a lot of, a lot of abuse in engine compartments and landing gear wells in particular. Um, another place for uh, wiring problems can be uh, underneath the galley or the lab on bigger airplanes. Um, coffee is corrosive and so is lab fl uh, lavatory fluid. Um, it can be kind of scary in there. Um, there's some with uh, some protective sheathing on it. Typically an orange ADEL clamp is a high temperature ADEL clamp. Um, the black ones with a black uh, protective on there is um, a, you know a standard temp engine compartment ones you're going to find them being made out of steel same as steel um, other places you may find them made out of other what materials about white, ones? white ones are Teflon yeah 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 because the, the King ears have them all over the place they do <laughs> and, and that and so huh, yeah and, and you'll see some that are blue um, there's you know hey I guess it depends what engineer wanted that day. And, um, but it's that, the first consideration is the environment. Um, you can see some pictures here, the right way and the wrong way. What's gonna happen with these 
if it, it with time and it gets a load on it, it's going to droop. And it's not the fact that it drooped, it's where is it going to droop? i have doing training sessions in industry with mechanics. They'd say, oh, I lost my screwdriver. Well, that's great. My question is, where is it? <laughs> it's not the, the loss, it's where is it? Because it's probably somewhere you don't want it. And um, that's why they ground the aircraft, because it could be in some, some area that's catastrophic. And um, so you can see the, uh, the safe angles there and so forth. Um, again, these things are um, called out in the uh, advisory circular. Um, so we have, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the grounding. Um, typically, you want to um, have it all grounded to the same point, unless you have um, certain specific systems need multiple grounds. That um, green stuff there is um, kind of a shellac product that makes it um, prevent corrosion and so forth down down the line. And um, some environment is good. You can see there's a wire code on that one. The larger the aircraft, the more digits are in the code. And um, yeah, and there you can see you see the lacing, the lacing wax thread, wax cord. Um, as some times they call that Chinese finger um, protective stuff. There, there's some tie wraps, but it's also with the uh, um, you know with the lacing cord. Lace, you'll see lacing cords used in the factories, and then the tie wraps are often. Uh, related to field repairs or field modifications. Question, question on that. That product to isolate the rust, could you use, I mean, I don't know yeah. if this is a basic question, but could you use electrical grease instead? Different purpose. Different purpose? Yeah. Um, some of the electrical greases are, are um, conductivity promoters. <coughs> and and, and I, I, I've seen both. And uh, the conductivity promoters are really cool. If you have a flashlight with a weak battery, you put some of that on there and it's like, presto, you just overhauled your door cells. I, 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 I would have never thought this stuff worked that good. Um, but it, it really, um, it comes, um, comes back to electric Right. Yeah, um, could be. You could possibly use that. Like that corning board? You, you could use that. The, the, remember, if you use something that stays tacky, so it's going to attract dirt. That's not going to attract dirt. So, you know, back to the environment. You know, you definitely wouldn't want to use these uh, Dow Corning products in your oxygen systems, because that all you have to do is blow oxygen on there the wrong way. Even if you have a bottle of ABO for emergencies, if you're breathing oxygen, you don't want to torch it off. Um, and it's it's very difficult to say how much oxygen you need to ignite grease. In one situation, it might just be a little bit. In some cases, it'll be a whole lot. Um, so um, tools. Wire stripping. I can say most EAA chapters I've been around have good stuff when it comes to their tools. Um, better than a lot of shops. Um, so I, I have a couple of um, stuff here. These are, I'll say, okay in a pinch. How many strands of wire can you break in when you strip the insulation before you really start over? None. Exactly. So how accurate is this? <laughs> Probably not. I'm not saying throw it away. I'm just saying think before you use. Um, on that Katon wire, this is devastating. It, it just, it'll nick it. You don't even have to break a steering. All you have to do is nick it, and it will be broken um, at some point when you least expect it. Um, so as a result, I like the Speedex strippers. Okay, you can actually use these in a tighter location than you can the other ones. And the, the likelihood of damaging the wire is all but completely reduced. And they come in different sizes. Um, this is for a smaller gauge, you make other ones for bigger, larger gauges. And um, if you ever have real world experience for the mechanics or the, those that built airplanes, if you're working on, you have just a really limited bit of wire to work with and you're working up there, and I call it the half pretzel, and you nick the wire and you damage it. Now you're back to square one because you don't have enough to make it to the connector anymore. Use $30 or $40 as opposed to $650. I'll spend the 40 bucks again, anytime. Um, terminals. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't have internet here. Um, but I brought some training aids, okay? Um, 
Does anybody up here, I, I, other than the EMPs, know the difference between an automotive crimp-on connector or an aircraft crimp-on connector? Can you tell by looking? Go ahead. Well, the aircraft connectors uh, have a uh, all metal into the insulator with a funnel into the crimp area. So you can't... Uh, Exactly. So I'm gonna let you guys. I have an aircraft one in the opaque or the kind of clear yellow, and an automotive one in here. Look inside the hole. Um, there's a lot of shops out there with the automotive ones. Um, it happens. I'll just you know, it's a it's. A, we'll just say it's a big world out there. There's a lot of people that just don't know what they don't know. Sad as it may sound, but yes, you see the the insulation grip, and um, and and whatnot. Um, I, I've got brought some samples of different kinds of connectors since we have a nice picture there. Um, Can you explain the difference in the construction and how it grip, like what makes the automotive, like what is the grip okay. or what's okay. the feature that makes it aircraft, I don't want to see it. So as those yellow ones go around the room, <coughs> you'll see the automotive one just has the barrel when you look in the end of the connector. The aircraft one will have, you'll be able to visibly see a second sleeve in there. Okay. Okay. It, it'll, when you look, compare it, here's, here's, here's a big, I mean, you can see, automotive. Very clear, oh, it's a live one. Um, very clearly automotive. I didn't have any um, aircraft ones that big because they don't let me work on airplanes anymore. That's a conflict of interest, go figure. Um, so now I have a couple 31 Model A's and stuff I, I do to keep my, my hands involved. Um, but as those yellow ones go around, that should um, help your question. There's a multitude of different connectors. Um, everybody's familiar with the old spade connectors that you push in. Not necessarily the best choice for aircraft. Um, I mean, it sure has a nice little insulation. I like the handshakes because it can't come apart. You connect it, put a piece of heat shrink on it or similar, put a lacing cord or a tie wrap on it and it won't come apart. Then there's, and I'll, I'll let you run that around. Then the other one that's really cool is a wrist lock. Um, even a little bit more technologically advanced, but no. Um, really cool, they won't come apart either. Um, there again, you have to protect it um, when you use it. But you don't want systems to come apart when, you're, um, when you really need it. Um, what, what's the price difference between an aviation and an automotive one? What's your life worth? <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just no, no, I mean, I, I don't know the difference. I, I and I, it's, 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 I gave you disclosure that I, I tend to be a wise guy. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can buy the automotive ones for pennies, and the uh, the, the, the aviation type terminals or the higher quality terminals yeah. are probably twenty to twenty-five cents a piece. Yeah, um, I'm going to show you one here. It's a couple of bucks. Um, that that's an aircraft one. Now, you can see how there's like two sleeves inside when you look at it. The, the, the larger one is the one that actually prints around the insulation. And uh, I guess you saw the other one, so you got you have that. Um, you mentioned about high dollar ones. This is a couple of bucks a piece. Um, but these are really neat. Um, you can use these to solder wires together to solder in your actual mouth um, with a heat gun. And then this shrinks down over the wire. Um, you'll see those used in um, some of the more extreme environments. If I could mention something about yeah, the aircraft type terminals with the metal sleeve that extends all the way back, when you make the insulation frame, so first is it's tapered to guide the conductor, the strains of the conductor into the crimp barrel. Second is the metal extending bank back when you crimp the insulation and you do it on an automotive uh, uh, connector, the plastic will tend to rebound and it really doesn't strain relief the wire. Where the ones with the metal in it, when you crimp it, it stays crimped and provides strain relief. Yeah, ex ex exactly right, and that's why I say the sad part of it is I don't have this video, but you can um, you you can do you can Google or YouTube. There's there's some really good YouTube videos um, on this. Actually, what I'll do is um, for Mark or Tom, I'll leave you with a copy of this presentation, and then if you guys want to um, send an email out to everybody with it, there's a couple of neato uh, videos in here um, explaining just that. Uh, you may or may not see the wire gauge on the terminals. Uh, kind of cool. Um, speaking of crimping, here's an old school set of crimpers for aircraft wiring. Production environment. You can't release it 
you can't get it off the connector until it's far enough to release. That makes, and these actually have to be calibrated. Um, the FAA guy, if you have a repair station, he may come in and say, let me see your calibrations. Been there. Um, and I wasn't pleased when he told me I had to get the calibrated list. He was right. Um, so that run these around, you can see how it locks. This, this model here is specific to blue wire, blue connectors. There's another one that's red, another one yellow, and so forth. Um, but, and, and you can see, just by playing with it there, that it is directional specific which way the terminal goes in it to do exactly what you're saying, properly crimping um, both the sleeves. There, there's another thing to point out, which is red, blue, and yellow mm -hmm. don't necessarily carry the same meaning for wire gauge sizes from manufacturer to manufacturer. Exactly, exactly. It does if you get mil-spec terminals. Uh, right. But if you just buy ones that aren't mil-spec qualified but, but are the same yeah. design, uh, sometimes they're, they'll vary by a wire gauge. Oh, yeah. So some of them are like 24 gauge to uh, like 24 to 20 gauge or 18. Yeah, usually 24 to 20 or 22 to 18. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you have unless you have any bottom part. Exactly. And go to a reputable source, just like you said. And so if you have one that's too small, you run the risk of damaging the wire when you crimp it or having a couple of the wire strands push out and you don't have a good connection. And if it's too large, there's, there's an increased likelihood of it coming off. Well, very well said. Um, so there's the crimping tools that we referred to, um, all of which are locking type tools. I think I, I saw in the, in, the, in the shop here somewhere a pair of these around. Um, perfect. These um, are for what they call pin type connectors. Uh, th those are largely used in the larger shops or avionics shops for the um, lot more delicate plugs and so forth. Um, any questions on, on any of that so far? Okay. Yeah. Again, I'm not experienced. Sure. But let's say I'm not you let's say I'm not used well, say it was an aviation, I'm loading on the car uh -huh. and I'm crimping two terminals like that. Uh -huh. I always feel like I want to crimp it so hard so it doesn't come out and then I also feel like I'm crimping it so hard that I don't know if I'm damaging the actual connection by applying too much force. Then I find it to an airplane if I were to build something it's a like, oh, when you're crimping something, does the tool, like you said about calibrating, like the regular cheap old, uh, regular tool, is it how much pressure do you apply on a, on a wire to okay. know that you're doing crimping it right? I'm going to let these two guys, because I, I like a, a, a savvy uh, audience. There's a pull test. Uh, something, a lot of the little gauge wires up to about 14 gauge wire, uh -huh. 15 pound pull. Okay. It should not come out. So, so you need some kind of gauge to test So you put a fish scale on, okay. hold the wire and fish scale on okay. the, the terminal on the other end, and it should not pull out at 15 pounds. Okay. And, and the last question on that, I thought I saw it on the internet somewhere that crimping is preferred than soldering in a cable for an airplane. Is that so, or is it depends on what you're doing? Uh, uh, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> The man of the pleasure! <laughs> so, an example. Uh -huh. A friend of mine who's in the hangar, RV7A in the hangar, with me. The guy built the airplane, and I helped him do a lot of the work on it. Uh -huh. When it came to doing the wiring, he bought the wiring kit from Bands. Uh -huh. However, when he ran the wire, when he ran uh, load carrying wires, the wires were too long. Bands supplied them too long, depending on how you wanted to wrap the wiring. Uh -huh. He was having problems with the Oh, losing power to the story. battery bus. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So we did a lot of looking into it, and he, he changed the battery relay, changed the battery switch, and every once in a while he'd just lose all his battery power for no reason. I mean, at one time he started the airplane up, it was running just fine, and all of a sudden no power. So we scratched our head a big time about that. And finally, I looked into it so much, I said, Bob, you've done the switch, you've done the relay, You've checked the connections. I said, the only thing left, like Sherlock Holmes says, well, everything that's impossible has been checked. Whatever remains, how in, however improbable, must be the truth. I said, Bob, the only thing we have not looked at is the wire that goes from the battery relay up to the bus. He said, I'll look into it. I left. He called me about an hour later and said, Tom, I cut the shrink wrap off the wire that I crimped on at the battery relay and he said I could pull the wire out of the terminal. It was building up so much corrosion because he didn't crimp it enough. So I took I brought down our 
hydraulic crimpers <laughs> and a new terminal and I crimped it on and then I soldered it. So is it recommended to solder then? Well, you can't no. solder the ones with the plastic. So the, 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 the no. two, two, two the points. Even the uninsulated one shouldn't be soldered. It's a straight relief problem. Right. Yeah. Well, it, well right. it wasn't on this one. It wasn't crimped. Well, right. So wrong crimped. That's so the, 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 there's kind of two two folds to yeah. You're you're right, and, and we'll, I'm gonna speak to that. Um, using a crimper, that won't release until it's properly crimped. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. You did. Calibrated, it's going to release at the proper time. Okay. 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 So part of maintenance is having consistent results. Now, the rub with using solder on connectors is a work hardness, just like a coat hanger. So only in limited circumstances do you want to solder a connection, and your maintenance man or whatever is going to um, tell you. You're, 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 you're going to have good luck finding a pair of those. <laughs> like, those have been around for since I got my AMP. That, that, um, actually, that's what building is using. We have some people here that fabricate tools for us, so I'm just curious. Oh, no, I think, I think you have. I, I think this guy fabricates anything. They still buy that. You still buy that. Okay, that's real. Yeah, and all, and all the sizes. No kidding. Wow. That, that, um, that, that thing's old enough to drink. Um, and then some. Um, most of what you're going to see in, in modern shops is something like that. Okay. Um, and then, of course, these in, in some of the, the higher, um, I'm going to say, intricacy kind of stuff when you get into the gold connectors and things like that. I, I missed it. So if I'm building my airplane, I, I get where Let's say if I use a tool like that, then I do the, the pressure yeah. test, and I'm fine that I'm flying, and the thing is not going to go loose. But can you say that it depends whether you solder well, uh, sometimes and not, depending on the application or? or the, the, the application is definitely important. Okay. Um, it, it, I mentioned the soldering because you, you will see it. It's not necessarily wrong, but it's very specific applications. Okay. okay. Um, and and it's, it's not fair um, for me to say specifically which application. Um, also, I'm ahead. So as an engineer that designs aircraft electrical systems, uh -huh. um, you, you can have solder connections if you have proper strain relief. So you don't exactly. want, so the problem with like an uninsulated connector that's designed to be crimped is if you solder it, the solder will, will wick back into the conductors and create an unsupported stiff point, right? So versus like say a mill circular connector that has solder pins on it, where you design to solder it, then the connector has a clamp to provide strain relief. So that's why that's okay, and soldering crimp terminals is not okay. okay. Yeah, you definitely don't want to solder, but you don't want to solder the wire and then put a crimp terminal on. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. That's well, no, you don't want to put a crimp terminal on and then solder the wire. Right. A lot of people do. Right. So that's, they that's, think it's a, you know, it's a belt and suspenders thing, but it actually, from a fatigue standpoint, and wire working, it, it's it's a it's a worse deal. Okay. Okay. But crimp crimpers. The forces that crimpers develop when they're properly sized for the terminal and the wire is enough to, you know, you start out with circular uh, little wires or strands in the wire. When you crimp, the crimp forces are high enough, that, hard enough, that it basically squeezes those conductors so that the round shape goes away and all the air that's in between the conductors is removed. That's how it prevents corrosion inside and cold welds the copper to the terminal. So, so that's a pretty, yeah, and when you get to these bigger terminals like you're talking about for uh, power wires, yeah, uh, and that wires. sort of thing where you have an uninsulated uh, crimp terminal, the forces are very high. I mean, I've got a, I don't have, you have hydraulic ones, but I, I have ones with what, you know, the do number two wire that's okay. got, you know, three foot yeah. handles on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's really important to get crimps right. Um, and on the on the crimping end, you if you don't need to use any uh, like material like the green material that you use to prevent you know to make that connection you, or electrical grease. No, no, no problem. The That's wire, you mean between the connector yeah, and the wire? Yeah, no. before you crimp it, you don't need to coat it. Good, good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned the value and the knowledge here. I guarantee you, you probably know light years more than I do. And, and I thank you for that. That's, use, use these 
you know, Tom's knowledge, your knowledge, um, who else is ever's knowledge, um, is, is you go forth with this stuff because it will improve, it will ensure, I won't say improve, it will ensure that you have an enjoyable experience with your aircraft. Um, you don't want a panel to go dark coming through the clouds. Um, I don't have one to go dark. We all have our cross of the bear, Tom. <laughs> yeah, but no, I, I that, that is, I had for, honestly forgotten that the, that, that the two materials basically fuse together because there's yeah. so much tension there. Yeah. If yeah. you actually slid the connect, sometimes engineering gets way too detailed. Yeah. But uh, taking uh, crimps to, to dissect them to see if the terminals the crimping is proper, uh -huh. and you slit the outer you know casing so there's a round barrel. You slit the barrel and open it up, and the wire's got to stick to it. Okay. Oh yeah, and and yeah. I I've seen that. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. You know what? He, he gave me a light bulb moment. I, that's why I enjoy this so much. Um, and I don't mean to say that to be patronistic or anything like that, but we all have those light bulb moments, and that's what um, it, it makes it, it it's, it's cool. Everybody seen this? Yeah. So, um, any other questions on, on connectors? And, um, so, wire chafing. Um, lots of things can cause that. Tie racks, in some cases, um, improperly used, um, could be structure around it. Um, any number of things. When you're doing your condition inspection, look look things over closely. Look the entire length. It doesn't mean to disassemb mean disassemble the whole aircraft, but get in there with a flashlight, give it a good look. Or not just spitting here a little bit. Um, so uh, value added. Um, and it, I have seen cases, and some of the other folks here, cases where there's been actually chafing in between the wires. It happens, um, in particular in high movement areas, landing gear areas, um, control surfaces if there's wires going through it. Um, so that's, uh, and there again, you can see that's the embossed numbering on, on some wire from, from the factory. Um, um, circuit protection, we talked about the, the circuit breakers. Um, th this one here, the number's actually kind of, I'll say etched in there. In the end of it, some of them it's just a little disc that's kind of pushed in there, and um, they do uh, do fail, uh, come out on occasion. Um, and like I say, you can't see it here, but oftentimes there's a line and load is what it'll say. Line would be the uh, input side, right? And um, now that one there, you're gonna have a hard time pulling it. Some of them that look like that to make a trip, you push it, and it'll pop back out. Um, the, I've seen that on a lot of. Uh, European French aircraft where you push it and make it pop out. Um, so there's a, a, a solenoid, could be a landing gear solenoid, could be a starter solenoid, hard to tell. Um, here's a fuse, just like this having the, uh, the number, the amp rating there, a fuse that's gonna be written in here in the barrel of the fuse somewhere. Um, there's lots of different kinds of fuses. Besides amp rating, some are a slow blow, which means it has to have over the, um, the rated load for a period of time before it flows, it fails and opens the circuit, and some go a period of time longer. Um, okay, oops, one button. There you go. Here's um, uh, some of your um, instructions for inspecting it. Uh, we have the, the OEM is the equip original equipment uh, manufacturer instructions um, for uh, uh, you know maintenance and inspection. You have their manual. Um, you could have an STC for something that's been put on your, your Cessna or something like that. Uh, somebody that didn't have ADSB when the airplane was built and he put it on now. This is not gonna be in a regular maintenance manual. It's gonna be, let's call it an addendum. When they did the modification, those instructions for continued airworthiness um, are now part of the inspection packet or the, the, the maintenance uh, data for the aircraft. Um, in the amateur built world, the experimental world, you're doing a condition inspection. You can add stuff to that all day long. It's your, your, your program, the builder's program, when, when they got it certificated. And um, then, um, of course, we have 4313-1B uh, is, is your uh, uh, pr procedures, the advisory circular on um, how to do that kind of stuff. There are cleaning products out there that are, going to, that are caustic to wire. And... Uh, uh, I would just recommend using 
products that you know are good for aircraft. There's a lot of a lot of them out there. Um, I, I would say one of the most problematic areas to clean on a, on a light airplane is the belly with all that exhaust, dirt, and grime, oil, all that stuff gets on the belly. And people, if, if the Dawn isn't working, let's get something a whole lot stronger. Um, and, and they can set up corrosion there as well. Uh, you want things that are neutral. And, and um, yeah, so years ago they found simple green was corrosive to the lupa. Yeah. People were using that left. Oh, they, they said, oh, it's environmentally friendly. It's got to be good for my airplane. That's why I don't recommend anything in particular. Here's real world experience. How many of you seen this, a, a gallon can around? It says, aircraft stripper. <laughs> it's not aircraft stripper. Read the back of the can, and the fine print it says, not approved for aircraft use. The only thing that makes it aircraft stripper is it's got that same consistency that um, you, you, you put it on there and it kind of hangs tight. Um, you got to read the fine print sometimes. Um, yeah. I, so, I, so, so on that corrosive aspect, there were Hughes 500s that were losing tail rotors because of Hughes corrosion. 500s, Bell Jet Rangers. They were basically, you know, the mechanics were cleaning with simple green and it caused corrosion and skin cracks yeah. in the blades. Yeah, it set up, it set up corrosion in between the materials. And, um, and for, I think if I recall correctly, on the 500, it was between the tip blocks the, the, very, the filler material yep. at the very end of the blade. Yep. And if you think about that blade, each blade is probably about that long, give or take. And if that comes out, even if it's an ounce, that thing's spinning around there pretty quick, and now you have the arm on it, all of a sudden... The whole blade's gone. The bl well, it's, if that's it's all you lose, because there, there, had, there, there were cases where it shook the whole gearbox off. Now you have, you've lost five, be, uh, five pounds, what, eight feet out, 10 feet out? How much moment arm is on that? Um, it, 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 does, it doesn't end well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the same thing with your, with, your, with your light airplane. If you lose something all the way at the end of the tail, um, a, a little bit adds up a long way. Not here to scare you, just, make, just give you a, a moment to pause and think. Um, here's different things that um, cause wire degradation. Um, previous repairs, Braided, cracked in a braided insulation, fluid chemicals. We talked about that. Corrosion um, could that could be skin corrosion is chafing up against the wire. Some of that stuff has um, blistering has some has some dimension to it. Um, if I recall correctly, that's a C90 King Air or vintage. Um, very common problem with that direct view window. It seals nice when the airplane's pressurized. When the airplane's not pressurized sitting out on a ramp, that's a real problem. That's the fuel management panel. Um, and most fuel management items are hot battery bus. So you've got a lot of power going in there because it's an essential system. When you're doing, those that have their own airplane, once in a while when you're cleaning it, it's not bad, a bad idea to take the hose and hit it pretty good and make sure there's no there's no leakage. The reason I say that is, is most of us hang around our airplanes. It doesn't see rain unless we're flying. I had an experience where it was always hangered. I was I was working for an organization. We took it the airplane to the shop, had an annual done, parked it out that night, went the next morning to pick it up. There was it rained like a big dog at night. Picked it up, something tanks water, something again. We're, holy crap! Did I get a tank of bad fuel? We had never had it out in the in the rain. We always hangered it. Guess what? We found the leaky access panels on the top of that wing the hard way. <laughs> yeah, sump your daggone fuel. Hence the reason when you wash it, that's a good time to look for leaks. You know? I'm sure it beats having a wet seat when you hop in to go home. So, yeah, leaks, leaks are not our friend. Um, so the maintenance in the uh, community, that includes you. Um, what we can do to, um, uh, you know, foster good, good wiring practices. Of course, we, sharing knowledge, that's what we've done here. I've got two other things here for you. Um, Tom and the other gentleman, I apologize, would you? Dan. 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 And there's another AMP here. I don't want you guys, okay. I want you guys to be mysteriously silent. <laughs> and I want somebody else to tell me 
how to tell, and I apologize for the size, an aircraft tie wrap from an automotive tie wrap. <laughs> there is a difference. Metal latch. Metal latch. Yes. You would be amazed at how many people go to get the DAR to certificate their amateur built airplane and it has automotive tie wraps on the engine frame and stuff like that. Um, in the engine compartment, if you're going to use them, you need to use higher temperature tie wraps. Again, typically they're blue. Um, for those that aren't familiar, I can run this around. I, I apologize. I don't have any big ones, but you can see in there, metal versus plastic. Um, here's, here's another one. This is, this is kind of cool because they come in different colors too, the aircraft ones, just like automotive. Um, um, this, we used to refer to this as railroad track, very handy. Um, in different locations to help keep wire looms from chafing against um, uh, different structures. And, um, and what's nice about that is you can, you can see the wire going through it as opposed to if you put sheathing over it until the sheathing is rubbed through. You don't know how far that's rubbed through the wire as well. So um, I, I just like to see stuff. Um, so we talked about this several times. Use, use, your, use, your, use your knowledge base. Use your friends around here. Um, nobody, trust me, nobody wants to go to a funeral. I'll say that a million times over. Um, that, right there. They don't move much, but they do help to move a lot. Fly, try to run a fly-by-wire airplane without power. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, the wires don't move, but they make, they make it happen. Um, so, um, so that's all I have on that. Um, <coughs> anybody have any questions? I'm, a, like I said, a non punitive guy. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, or, and you can pose it to anybody else in here on wiring or experiences. I got a call from a friend today. <coughs> he bought a 210 to a friend of mine, and I delivered it down to Marco Island in Florida for this guy three years ago. So <coughs> he was a new pilot, had his gear up landing, got that out of his system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So he called me this afternoon from Tennessee. He flew to, out to Tennessee. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, had some business out there. He went out to come home this morning, and the battery was dead. He couldn't figure out what was going on. Battery only had two tenths of a volt in it. So, took the battery out, charged it up, and when he connected the battery back up, the airplane powered back up with the master switch off. He flipped the master switch on and off two or three times, and it never disconnected. The battery the relay was welded shut. Mm -hmm. It happened. I've seen situations where the start relay failed and it continued to crank yep. after the engine's running. Yep. So they, they're mechanical parts. So he wow. got out there and he tapped on the relay and it opened up, but he's got another one coming in from aircraft. Yeah, does, does he really want to fly in that, you know, yeah. Well, he only had three and a half hours to go to get back home. <laughs> it's like, well, you know the battery, you know the relay's not going to open up. Yeah. <laughs> meeting, you, you shared what you're building and all that stuff. But there's one of the things I really like is sharing when things don't go so well. And I, I'm a huge believer of OJT, um, where the old masters that used to cut stones and make wood, they say, but don't put your hand in there, son, because that's what happens. You know? And they show you they show your hand missing a digit. Um, so yeah, so share, you know, share some of that, that stuff. If you know, if you can it, there's huge huge value added in it. Um, speaking of seatbelts. There's been more than one aircraft I went and went to inspect, not from accidents, but just in the course of annuals or whatever. And right behind a door, it's all beat up. S didn't wear seatbelts. <clears throat> it's hanging outside the stinking door. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I just, it, it leaves you without, you know. Speaking that, of that, yeah. when I do an inspection on an airplane with an inertia reel, I pull the harness all the way out of the reel to check the frame because they always get frayed right where they normally get used. Yeah. But if you don't pull it out during an inspection, you'll never see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. so that's, um, yeah, it's all, all good stuff. Um, maintenance wise, cleaning your, cleaning your bubble, cleaning the glass. Don't use Windex. <laughs> There's, you wouldn't use it on your, well, maybe some people would use it on our glasses, but um, I, I personally like to use aircraft specific window cleaner on my glasses. I get a few years out of it. Um, so, and some of them, some of those products are anti-fog. So my glasses don't fog up. 
So how does this stuff work? It's magic. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge machine. So here, okay, um, to me, Mark. Yeah. Okay, okay. If, if you got a hole in the bulkhead, you put this around the hole in the oh, bulkhead. Oh, 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 yeah. And there's different sizes yeah. and epoxy or something. Yeah. Some yeah. Some sort of yeah. Yeah. How do you yeah. prevent it from sliding out, Mark? For the it's glued in. in. Oh. Oh. You glue it in when you put it in. Yeah. There is a newer product uh, that's been around since. Forever. Before time. Yeah. Uh, there is a that newer is, product yes. up, out there that's uh, a metal form piece mm -hmm. with a nylatron insert. Yeah. And it clips on the metal so you don't have to glue it. Uh, uh -huh. They work really yeah. well. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. It's a bit more expensive. That stuff's ten a foot or something. But yeah. the other stuff's like a buck and a half a foot. But it's worth it. Yeah. There is. Yeah, hadn't, hadn't seen this. Yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff out there. Um, you know, I showed showed you this. This is typically used. Remember the old, um, what do they call them, the um, dot matrix printers with a railroad track? Mm -hmm. This is actually used on a machine like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it prints in like a typewriter on there. And just, you know, if you have 200, you know, 100 foot length of wire, or even a 10 foot length of wire, you can put it in there and it'll print 15 identical ones on there and just fly on the wire, heat shrink it. Um, speaking of heat shrink, we're, we're about that out of time. Maker Let's wrap it up. That you yeah. buy yeah. and shrink yeah. and roll and you put it in the label maker. And print out whatever you want. Yeah, provided it, can, it stays on. Yeah, it does. It's, uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, I don't have anything further. Do any, does anybody have any other questions? And I'll turn it over to the. Uh, that was great, Jim. Thanks. Okay. Very much. Thank you.